Well, as Jonathan said just there then, we've all had Sundays, haven't we? I'm sure where we've climbed into bed at uh, half past 10 or whatever, with this thought in our heads, I got nothing from the preaching today. And as Jonathan also said, in those situations, the next thought that immediately crosses our minds is probably a critical one about the preacher. He was too technical. He was too jokey. He was too predictable. He preached his hobby horse rather than the text. His mannerisms were off-putting. Now, the preacher on that Sunday may indeed have committed the fault or the faults that we're alleging, but I wonder, do we ever ask the question, does any fault lie with me? Could I have done more? I think we should ask that question, and probably the answer is usually, I could have done more. And that's what we're going to think about then in this second lecture, our responsibilities as listeners on the Lord's Day, getting more out of sermons. And we're going to take a very simple approach to this. We're going to look at three texts which I think are relevant, and the three headings then which you can see on your handout are three hopefully memorable slogans taken verbatim from those three texts. So first of all then, not only in word, not only in word, and the text here is 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5. Paul is reminding the Thessalonians of his ministry when he had visited their city, that visit that's recorded for us, of course, in Acts chapter 17. And what he says here is fascinating, I think. Paul makes a boast here in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5 that is probably the exact opposite of the one which we conservative evangelicals would make if we had been on a mission trip somewhere. We would say we went to that place only with the word. Nothing else, naked preaching. We just unleashed the word so that it could do its stuff. That's what we would probably say. Paul, on the other hand, says here, my ministry was not only in word. Not only in word. What on earth does he mean? Does he mean that he threw in some of those theatrical arts that Michael Horton was talking about in that quote? A bit of music, a bit of dance or something. Well, no, of course he doesn't mean that. This is what he says. It came to you, our gospel, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So the additional element then in Paul's ministry, the thing which accompanied his preaching, it wasn't theatrical arts, it was the powerful activity of the Holy Spirit as he preached. And it seems to me then that the necessity of that, the necessity of the Holy Spirit working powerfully as the word is preached, it's massively overlooked today. And it's overlooked often then in the name of orthodoxy. We're Bible people, we say. Sola Scriptura, that's our motto. The word of God is sufficient to do the work of God, a motto some of you will perhaps have heard. And indeed, there's a text then that often gets bandied about in this connection. It's Isaiah 55 verse 11, which again, many of you will be familiar with. My word, my word that goes out from my mouth it shall not return to me empty, Yahweh says. Now I think that there's a category error going on here. Uh, so that text is often treated as though it relates to the doctrine of Scripture and it's teaching that Scripture has some kind of intrinsic and invariable efficacy about it. In my view, this text better relates to the doctrine of effectual calling. And I think you, you get that from the context where 
Um, there's been this invitation that, yeah, that has been put out in verses six and seven of the chapter. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So this invitation is being put out to godless, idol-worshipping Israelites to return, to repent, to come back to Yahweh. And you think, well, what are the chances of them responding? Well, this is the thing. God is going to compel some of them to respond. For some of them, that invitation is going to be endued with irresistible power so that assuredly they will, verse 12, go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Led forth in peace. And that's then what Yahweh means when he says in verse 11 that my word shall not return to me empty. He is going to compel in the invitation itself some of these Israelites to respond to the invitation. But it's one thing then to say when God calls his elect to repentance and faith, that call cannot fail. That's true. It's another thing to say whenever the scriptures are read and preached, things happen because they have an intrinsic and invariable efficacy. Isaiah 55, 11 teaches the former, it does not teach the latter. Indeed, the latter is wrong. It's wrong, there is no intrinsic and invariable efficacy when the scriptures are read and preached. Things only happen when the scriptures are read and preached if in that moment the Holy Spirit works powerfully with them and through them and makes things happen. Let's put it this way. Suppose for a moment that your pastor is preaching through Romans and this Sunday then he's preaching Romans 8. Now, behind you being blessed through Romans 8 this Sunday, there lies a process. That process begins the day Paul sits down and writes that passage. It culminates as you sit in the pew at 11 a.m. on Sunday listening intently to the sermon. This is the thing. The Holy Spirit must be involved at both ends of the process. Now, we know that he was involved, absolutely, at one end of the process. As Paul sat down and wrote, the Spirit was involved. So that Romans 8 is a spirit-inspired, inerrant, infallible piece of writing. We can be sure about that. But that's not enough. The Spirit's involvement back then doesn't remotely guarantee that you will be blessed as Romans 8 is read and preached this Sunday. His involvement back then is certainly necessary. And if he hadn't been involved back then, then you definitely wouldn't be blessed being exposed to Romans 8 this Sunday. But his involvement back then is not enough. He must be involved this Sunday too. You see this in 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12 where Peter writes this, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So there Peter is saying that when the prophets prophesied, when they spoke and wrote, the Holy Spirit was was prompting them, was carrying them, was inspiring them. But then he continues, it was revealed to them, that's to the prophets, that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So you see how the Spirit is involved at both ends. He was involved when the prophetic writings first came into existence. He was the one inspiring them, but he was also involved when those prophetic writings were being announced, were being preached to these people to whom Peter was writing. And the Spirit's involvement only back in Hosea's day and Jeremiah's day and Isaiah's day, that would not have been enough for these people to have been affected. There had to be this fresh involvement of the Spirit as the Scriptures were read and expounded. 
So, what does all this mean then with respect to us getting more out of sermons? Well, it means that privately and corporately we should be praying Monday to Saturday that the Holy Spirit will work powerfully as the word is preached. We shouldn't just show up on a Sunday presumptuously on the supposition that by being exposed to the scriptures we will automatically be blessed because his word never returns empty. No, we need to be praying. Praying for the preacher, praying for ourselves, praying that the Holy Spirit will work powerfully, praying in the terminology of our previous lecture that Jesus will indeed preach to us this coming Lord's Day. Let me just end this point with, with two quotes. First of all, Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford preaching on the parable of the great banquet and all those excuses that were offered why they weren't going to go to the banquet. And he reflects then on this uh, sobering phenomenon of men and women declining and rejecting the gospel. And this is what he says. Here are many called but they excuse themselves that they cannot come because of other employments. This should teach us to hang upon the word, but withal to look beyond the word, and with the use of the word, call for the inward grace of the spirit. He then uses an analogy. It is not the bottle of the physician that heals the sick, but the medicine in the bottle. The word and sacraments are but empty bottles, except the Lord fill them with his virtue. And without this secret virtue, we shall set our mouth to an empty bottle and draw in wind. That's quite striking, isn't it, what he says there? I mean, think of the images that you and I might use for the Bible. We might talk about it as a lamp as a map, as a sword, as a feast. I'm not sure I've ever heard anyone except Samuel Rutherford talk about the Bible as an empty bottle from which you draw nothing but wind unless the Spirit blesses the reading and exposition of it. Or John Owen in volume three talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, he that would separate the spirit from the word had as good burn his Bible. The bare letter of the New Testament will not generate faith and obedience in the souls of men. Only when the spirit is powerfully at work will there be any profit from the reading and preaching of God's words. So getting more out of sermons, we need to be those who take this seriously, not only in word. We don't just want the word unleashed tomorrow. We want more than the word. Not gimmicks. The more than the word that we want is the spirit. The spirit using and being active in and through the word. So that's the first biblical slogan, not only in words. Secondly, the measure you use. The measure you use, and this is Jesus speaking in Mark 4, verse 24. And the context here is parables. Jesus has just told a parable, but not only that, he's talking a little about the nature and purpose of parables. An area in which we often, I think, get completely the wrong end of the stick. We are prone perhaps to think and talk of Jesus' parables as illustrations. What lovely illustrations his parables are. That actually is really the opposite of how Jesus' parables functioned. They didn't illustrate, they obscured. They obscured. So verse one of Mark four, tells us about this large crowd that had gathered on this day to hear Jesus, such a large crowd. You remember that Jesus has to get in a boat uh, in order to address 
the crowd. But then he tells the parable and you get to verse 10. And in verse 10, the large crowd is no longer to be seen. Instead, we read, when he was alone, that's Jesus, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. So we've now gone from this very large crowd to just the 12 plus a few others there in verse 10 who asked Jesus the meaning. So they get the stuff about the seed being the word of God, about the birds being Satan, about the thorns being the cares of this world and all the rest of it. The vast majority of people who have heard that parable, they go away having heard nothing but a little tale about a farmer. And that's it. Nothing more than that. So that we're not meant to get to the end of verse 20 thinking, wonderful illustration, Jesus. We're meant to get to the end of verse 20, scratching our heads saying, Jesus, why didn't you just tell the crowd straight? If you had stated in plain prose that there are different responses to the word of God, there's this response and there's this response and there's that response, then the crowd uh, wouldn't have gone away with nothing more than a, a trite little story ringing in their ears. Why did you have to be so cryptic, Jesus? That's what we're meant to think. And actually, when you think about it, that same protest we could make about the Bible as a whole, couldn't we? Yes, we talk about the perspicuity of Scripture, and there's an important truth contained in that concept, but actually, the Bible is not a very easy read, is it? That's why Peter says that some of Paul's letters are hard to understand, 2 Peter 3.16 it's why the Ethiopian eunuch says to Philip, how can I understand this unless I have someone to guide me? It's why God endows his church with those who labor, Paul says, in preaching and teaching, 1 Timothy 5, 17. I know what it is, and some of you will, to almost literally experience blood, sweat, and tears, certainly two of those things, sitting in my study, trying to untangle some knot or other in a passage in order to be able to make sense of it for the congregation the coming Sunday. Why didn't God just make the whole thing a bit simpler? Well, Mark 4.24 is a large part of the answer to that question. So here, Jesus has this exhortation, pay attention to what you hear, followed then by this proverb with the measure you use it will be measured to you dick france in his commentary on mark's gospel um, just paraphrases it very simply you get out what you put in that's what jesus is saying with the measure you use it will be measured to you you get out what you put in and the point is then that god wants hungry disciples, not lazy scroungers who just open their mouths and expect to receive effortlessly the riches of God's revelation. No, he wants hungry disciples who esteem God so highly that they want to get to grips with everything that he has revealed and they are willing to probe in order to do so and to delve in order to do so and to grapple in order to do so. You see, the vast majority of this crowd on the lakeside this day, they're in the lazy scroungers camp. They mooch away from this lakeside saying to each other, what on earth was that about? Why have we come out here to this lakeside this morning to hear a guy talking about a farmer throwing some seed and some grass? What a silly little tale that was. What a waste of time. And those in verse 10, they're just as uncomprehending. They don't understand either what this is about but they know there must be more to it. And they want that more that they know there must be to it. And so they linger and they probe and they delve. They ask Jesus and they end up getting more. They get the meaning that Jesus then outlines. 
And it's in that spirit then that we need to listen to sermons. One of the criticisms that I mentioned in my introduction that perhaps we, we throw out, at least to ourselves, as we're lying in bed at half ten on a Sunday evening, it was too technical. The preacher was too technical. And that can be the case. And it's unfortunate when that is the case. No preacher should overcomplicate the word of God. But actually, however brilliant the preacher may be at explaining and elucidating God's word. Think of Ted Donnelly who passed away last weekend and the clarity with which he could explain God's word. But however brilliant a preacher may be at doing that, proper biblical exposition is still never going to be a simple little talk that you can just casually, almost half-heartedly tune into and then go away having been fed and enriched. The way that God has presented his revelation in this challenging, difficult book, the Bible, it makes that impossible. And God wants it to be impossible. He has deliberately designed it that we have to put a lot in to engage him with his word in order to get a lot out. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we go to church on Sundays hungry and eager and willing to do some serious work? Not leaving our brains at the door, but eager and willing to do some serious mental exertion because those are the disciples that God wants. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And if you put a lot in, you will get a lot out. Just going to, in this connection, quote something from Don Carson in his his book that's really about his father and his ministry in Quebec. Um, And but Don Carson talks in that context about um, some encouragements in that very barren place uh, in the 1970s and how there was, some, there was some real growth over a very short period of time in the evangelical churches in Quebec in the 1970s. And he says this, he says, I finished my PhD in the autumn of 1975 and took up a post in Vancouver on Canada's west coast Because of my facility in French, it was not long before I was flying back and forth across the country to make minor contributions in Quebec. In the summer of 1976, I spent a week or 10 days teaching a modular course in Sherbrooke. On the Wednesday night, I was asked to speak at the prayer meeting and Bible study of the church there. I asked the pastor on arrival how long I had to speak. He replied, these people are hungry for the word. I never take less than an hour. As a visitor, of course, you should take more. I arrived at 7.30. About 85 people were present. There was half an hour of reverent singing, some of it freshly written hymns and songs. Shortly after 8 o'clock, I began to preach. I finished just before 9.30. The pastor said this was a wonderful opportunity to ask any question they wanted about what the Bible said. I answered questions until 10 p.m. Then prayer requests were solicited, and almost all of them had to do with the conversion of people or the growth of people to whom these believers were bearing witness. We got down on our knees to pray about 10.30 p.m. I was the first to leave sometime between 12.30 and 1 as I still had some preparation to do for my class at 8 a.m. the next morning. The pastor assured me that this was a fairly normal Wednesday evening. Hunger for the word. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So, first slogan not only in word, second slogan, the measure you use, but then third slogan, the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. And this is Jesus, of course, speaking in Matthew 26, 41. And the flesh here is not being used in the more technical sense that we get later on in the New Testament, especially in Paul's writings. There, the flesh is that impulse in human beings to disobey God, and it's contrasted with the Spirit, capital S. 
Uh, every human being is controlled either by the flesh, the impulse to disobey God, or by the Holy Spirit. And even within those controlled by the Spirit, of course, the flesh remains as a residual presence, resisting the Spirit so that a battle is constantly going on. But here, in Matthew 26, 41, the flesh is simply an alternative term for the body. It's the physical dimension to us human beings, and it's contrasted with the spirit, small s, i.e. the non-physical dimension to us human beings. Now, the New Testament clearly teaches that our bodies experience delayed participation in redemption. We eagerly await the redemption of our bodies, Paul writes, Romans 8, 23. Only on the last day will they be resurrected and glorified. There's no process involved which begins at conversion and carries on in this life. On the contrary, our bodies are only declining. They're going one way and only one way throughout this life. The whole thing, the whole redemption of our bodies awaits the end, the last day. And that leads to a carefully nuanced attitude in the New Testament to the believer's body in this present age. We might say the New Testament couples moral expectation with practical realism. So moral expectation, we have to present our members that is our body part, to God as instruments for righteousness, Romans 6.13. Our bodies are a living sacrifice, Romans 12, verse 1. So holiness must emphatically extend to our bodies. But then on the other hand, practical realism, by which I mean the New Testament recognizes that the frail and declining nature of our still unredeemed bodies will sometimes hinder us in the performance of Christian duties. And that's what's going on here, of course, in Matthew 26. It's Gethsemane. Jesus has instructed these disciples to pray, but it's late at night, and their bodies are tired and sleepy, and that hinders their praying. We've all experienced that, haven't we? We've all experienced tiredness, bodily tiredness, getting in the way of times of prayer. And similarly then, factors relating to our still unredeemed bodies can also hinder our engagement with preaching. We can have willing spirits on a Sunday. Those disciples had willing spirits in the garden. They wanted to pray, but bodily weakness got in the way. And we we can have willing spirits as we come to the preaching on a Sunday, we can have that hunger that we've just been talking about. But then fleshly weakness, the weakness associated with our still unredeemed bodies, it can get in the way of us properly benefit, benefiting from the preaching of God's word. And what I want to stress then as I close is that while those factors can't be eliminated, it is a reality until Resurrection Day, while those factors can't be eliminated, they can be mitigated often. And by mitigating those factors then, we'll perhaps get more out of sermons. And I'm I'm thinking here of just very, very, very basic stuff. So if tiredness often affects you when you're listening to preaching on a Sunday, could you perhaps get more sleep the night before? Not stay up late to watch that program that you wanted to watch, but get an early night? If you're very sensitive to movements and noises around you, could you perhaps sit at the front so that there are no distractions between you and the preacher? I know that's a radical thing in our Reformed evangelical churches, not to sit at the very, very back, but perhaps you could. If, like me, being near a heater tends to make your mind go fuzzy, could you perhaps sit as far away as possible from a heater? If your mind easily wanders when you're listening to someone talk, would it help to 
Take notes. If you can't hold a phone in your hand without needing to check your messages, then would it perhaps be better to bring up an old-fashioned Bible with you into the church rather than using the one on your phone? At the risk of being indelicate, if a cup of coffee makes you need the toilet about an hour later, then would it perhaps be better not to have a cup of coffee before you leave the house? The flesh is weak, Jesus says. And yes, that, that, should, that should make us sympathetic in many circumstances. That's why we will have Eutychuses in our congregation who have been on the night shift on a Saturday and worked all the way until Sunday afternoon and they've struggled to get to the service on a Sunday evening and they fall asleep. And we don't tear a strip off them after the service. What were you doing snoring through my message? Because the flesh is weak. They've been working hard. There'll be older brothers and sisters who can't come out at all anymore on a Sunday. And again, we don't put them forward for church discipline because they're not coming out. They can't come out. The flesh is weak. We're sympathetic in those circumstances. But where we can fight back against the weakness of the flesh so that it doesn't hinder us so much benefiting from the preaching on the Lord's Day. Let, let's do that, let's fight back. Let's mitigate those factors. Let's do all we can to, despite the weakness of the flesh, still profit from the preaching of God's word. So none of that is rocket science, just three texts that you'll be familiar with to hopefully help us in this area where we all struggle not only in word, let's be those who are praying for the activity of the Spirit every time the word is preached. The measure you use, let's be those who approach preaching with a willingness to do the hard work that it requires. The flesh is weak. Let's seek as much as we can to mitigate that fleshly, bodily weakness so that it doesn't get in the way of us receiving God's word. Amen.